I start. Okay, well, I'm Tom Mellons, and full disclosure, I have known Cynthia for a very long time. I was calculating maybe it's close to 45 years, and in a former life, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and the various uh, identifiers. One that was left out is that I was actually Cynthia's studio assistant uh, long, long ago. And, uh, and we worked together actually on a uh, project, on an installation that was really wonderful called Tough Shifts for MIT in Boston. And it was, uh, Cynthia's piece had that title, and the exhibition was called, I believe, Rooms. And there were three artists who were represented, Cynthia, Richard Archwager, and Richard Haas, who I see in the audience, so thank you for coming. Uh, so. When I was looking at your book uh, and reading the essays and looking at our uh, conversation, one of the things that struck me, besides the fact that the work is just really compelling and beautiful, is that there is a lot of it. So you clearly work a lot. Uh, and that got me thinking simply about the nature of work and what it means to you. Uh, and particularly if you have ideas about what it makes to, what, what it means to work at making art, and if you feel like that concept it was in any way informed by a shared concept of that among your contemporaries, um, and just how you look at the notion of producing, and whether or not for you the work of making art is similar or different from other types of work. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm compulsive, so I've always, whether it was working, working or cooking or almost anything, I'm kind of compulsive, so work followed along that route. And I mean, I since I went to since I was small, I was drawing and painting, trying to get the kids in the neighborhood to agree to coloring, and they all poo pooed on it. And I was, well, what's the matter with them? Why don't they want to draw and paint? You know, but so it seemed something that I was engaged in from a, for a very, very long time. But I, I mean, I, in my forty years of teaching, I always emphasized work of art, work of art, because if you don't get up and go in the studio every day, every day nothing happens. And it's really hard when you get out of school if you don't do that because n nobody's grading you. Nobody's telling you, you know, this is good work, this is bad work. Mm -hmm. It's all up to you. And every artist in the room knows how hard that is. And they're all, uh, they all of my friends here are serious artists who've been at it all their life. And that was the groundwork, is work. And then you have your ideas and you pursue them and you work at them. Does that answer your question? It does indeed. <laughs> uh, a lot of the work, not all of it, but a lot of your work was associated with the so-called pattern and decoration movement. And I was thinking about that today in anticipation of this conversation and how those words are always used together describing a single attitude or a single approach, obviously variously interpreted, but a single um, unifying idea. But if you think about it, those words are really quite different. And pattern, I associate pattern with order, with structure, often with repetition. And I associate decoration, not necessarily uh, burdening it with uh, value judgment, but I associate pattern with something looser, with something less fundamental. So I wonder about uh, what those words meant to you and what you think, ha how that was expressed in your work. Uh, the, the, the people who originated the group of artists who uh, began pattern decoration, uh, which I was not a member of at that point, um, some of them were very engaged in uh, pattern, only pattern, and others were engaged in decoration mm -hmm. in more, you know, free-flowing way. Mm -hmm. So the crossover really uh, came from people, I think, writing about it and from members of the group who originally got together and had a few meetings because they saw that the work that they were doing was somehow n not fitting the mainstream of what was going on, but it was something different, and they wanted to sort of figure out what it was by these conversations. 
so they were put together. Um, and very comfortably so, because it very often overlaps. In my own case, it overlapped. Um, I'm going to be hard pressed to think when I started being obsessed, engaged with the pattern, um, but it was very early on. And it's been a constant in my work, not necessarily throughout the work, but it seems, and decorative issues, both seem to come back no matter what um, particular ideas I'm involved with at the moment. Uh, it, it, if I go away from that for a short time and do something else, then um, I eventually end up coming back to it. So. Um, was it something that you felt you needed to defend in any way, and particularly the decorative part? Was it something that was, uh, what was that term always used in a, in a respectful way, or was it sometimes used in a dismissive way? And was the fact that it was picked up and used by the artist a kind of, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make this word have positive associations? That was true for all the artists that were involved, but it definitely, it was, uh, and, 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 used to be, it still is, in some small circles, um, it has a negative cast. Not for any of us and not for all the many younger generations that have been influenced and doing work which is clearly has the ingredients of pattern and or decoration, even though the work might have other ramifications as well, as well, perhaps political or perhaps, you know, other ideas, but still those ingredients are involved. Um, so um, I think the original group, and now I include myself in that, um, w w fought for that mm -hmm. and were willing to um, go against it and be proud of going against it and take all the flack. Um, I, I think that's still an issue. We don't find um, fantastic museum support for those kinds of shows. Uh, however, it, it, it does begin to happen in both Europe and here. So. Um, uh, it does. Uh, so you fought for it and you won, um, uh, more, more or less. Um, you, in the course of, of that response, talked about uh, younger artists who were doing overtly political work, sometimes bringing in elements of pattern and decoration, yeah. but, but nonetheless there is a political thrust, which makes me think about, uh, well, a, a few things. One is, the role of feminism in your work, and if that uh, is something that resonates with you, or something that largely emanated from other people and, and wasn't necessarily on your mind, and then I'm gonna circle back to the relationship of, of political content with a formal language. You yeah, ask very complicated questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my work from almost the beginning of the 70s, everyone that sees it, sees immediately a feminist uh, kind of quality to it, whether it's with the drawings using safety pins and snaps from garters and things like that, or whether it was uh, vaginal subject matter, which none of that was obvious to me. I mean, I guess I wasn't the sharpest tack in the box about <laughs> feminism because I never made those associations until everyone else did. And then I said, oh, of course. <laughs> Of course that was it. <laughs> and it just could be because um, I wasn't thinking of it on a conscious level. And I have to say that a lot of times I don't know what I'm doing on a conscious level. It's only in hindsight. And sometimes, often, someone else will point it out by just something offhand that's said in my studio and it clicks and I say, yes, that has something to do with what I'm doing. And then I can go deeper into it. You know, I can find my way to to a deeper uh, thought process and idea about where the genesis of the work lies. But at the beginning, I just have to have faith in, and this has taken a long time because I tend to work in series, and then I have a hiatus where uh, I don't know what to do and I'm lost and totally frightened that I'll never make art again. And then I always do, something else comes to me, and um, uh, I move on. When you talk about not being necessarily aware of a content or message in your work and that it sometimes your awareness of it is actually triggered by someone else's comment, 
I'm wondering if it's possible, and it may not be, but if it's possible to describe what it feels like when you're making art, what, what is the thought process, or is it uh, not explicable in words? It's not. <laughs> and that's why you make art. but I don't know how genuine that would be. Uh -huh. I mean, the truth is I am always lost. But what has happened over time is that by now, at my age, at least I have faith that something will happen. You know, so I'm not quite as panicked as I used to be about not being able to work for a bit. But um, uh, yes, I just, you know, okay, if I just pursue this, and I don't know, it has to have some kind of deeper feeling of authenticity. Like I've had, you know, any number of false starts and done a number of works and say, no, I can't, nah, this doesn't make sense. So this, this, is not, this is not it. And I can never say what that is. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm sure uh, other people have another take on it. Like when, for example, when I did this series on animals, pet paintings, uh, it started because I was lost and I didn't know what else to do and my cat was laying on my drawing paper so I started drawing her and it, and it evolved into a whole series of work that I loved which was different from any other. It was like 19th century uh, direct easel painting kind of marking instead of drawing and that hadn't been where I did before but um, it, it took a while where I thought I was just fooling around and then I knew, damn, these are really good. And they became quite serious, and I pursued them. To circle back to the idea of political content uh, and uh, how a feminist element in your work may or may not have been self-conscious, but, uh, but it feels to me that whatever the content of your work, that there's always a belief in the validity of formalism. There's always a belief in uh, the joy of painting and the joy of pattern and decoration uh, and, and a formal visual language. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that balance um, in your work and that balance in some of the work that's being produced today by other artists. Uh, keep today's artists away because it's too much for me to think about until <laughs> ask it again as a separate question. Okay. So, what was your question? <laughs> okay, what that reminds me of is that when uh, Gertrude Stein was on her deathbed and she's surrounded by her friends and family, including, of course, Alice B. Douglas, she uh, looks up and says, what is the answer? And of course, there's dead silence, and she says, okay, in that case, what's the question? <laughs> so, the question just has to do with a balance between um, well, it has to do with a, a belief in the validity of a formal language and how that gets yeah, balanced yeah. with any other consideration. Yeah, um, I think that uh, uh, because I came through an art school and had an art, you know, uh, courses in the normal way of design and, and color and all these things, I think that was embedded. Then, when you go out and start your own ideas, it doesn't reside on the surface but it's there in a more unconscious way and just takes over and determines the issues in the work, but you don't have to concentrate on it. There are a whole school of artists for whom formalism is the issue. And I have to say that the recent shape canvases I'm doing began with that because I started with a group of works that I uh, dismissed and decided I wanted to continue, but because I'm cheap, I had about 90 canvases, which were small, corporate sizes, and I wanted to work bigger, so I hardware them together from the back, and that gave me a shape and lines, and that was like drawing, and you had to begin with that. You couldn't ignore it, that was it. So that was, it prescribed a very formalistic approach, and so that's the first time I think that I've ever begun with that as a serious um, beginning point for the idea. And, and it goes from there. But you know, in addition to formalism as an issue in art, I had to give it a kick in the pants too. It has to have a little, you know, humor or something that sort of twists it and says, yeah, but not quite. <laughs> you know, that's, 
how I look at the recent work. Well, the, the issue of humor is interesting to me uh, because I think it runs through a lot of your work. It Cer certainly, it, 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 it's a, uh, I think a, a striking part of your uh, personality and, and uh, what, what, what I know about you. And so, um, but when you said that you had to give the, the work a kick in the pants or you had to give the formal beginning a kick in the pants, um, it strikes me that the humor Oh, often has an, uh, an edge of irony to it, or an edge irony, or, or an edge of, of coming at it from a, a little bit of an angle. And I wonder if that resonates with you. Uh, you know, it's, all, it's not in all bodies of work. The joy has always been there, whether I wanted to or not. Even when I try to start out, I'm gonna do a depressing painting. It ends up that way. But the humor, I think that you know, my grounding was in Chicago, and I was at this art school at the same time as the Harry Who. And for them, all of the um, irony and against the, uh, you know, against New York, whatever right. was going on. And I had a little reunion with some of those friends this last weekend, and we were reminiscing. We were just having fun. And it was at a time when well, I mean, it was all, the Chicago thing had a, a, a big grounding in the vernacular. So, you know, foolish advertisements, the kind that come in the back of magazines where they're advertising, you know, to buy a piece of chest hair and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> those, were the, those were the fundamental um, beginnings for that group. And although I was not a member of that group, they were really, Many of them were my dear friends. And so, you know, it stuck there. It, it was there. And I've always, I'm not sure why, I've always insisted, you know, it's not a knee slap or anything, but I've always insisted on some bit of humor in the work, with the exception of a couple of bodies that were, did not have that ingredient. The Chicago part of the story is interesting to me because it, it seems to me that you, when you decided to have your professional life rooted in New York, at the center of the art universe, that it was significant that you were of that, but not from that, and that that gave you a, a, a perspective. Well, you know, when I start, those people, the Harry Who images and the images, it, they were pretty amazing people because they all found their way very early while they were still in school. And many of the paintings that are now in museums are, are now, I mean, many of the work from their school years are now in museums. I was a, just a very dutiful student. And I was just doing, we got a still life, I'm doing a still life. Oh, now we have a model, I'm doing a model. It took me a very long time to grow into my work. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say it was a few years out of graduate school that I really started to feel myself an individual. I had made attempts in that direction in a very awkward way while I was in, in school, uh, in undergraduate, but they weren't great paintings. You know, I'm reminded of, I was thinking about this today. There was a show a number of years ago that, I'm not gonna tell the whole story because it's long, but there was an exhibition in Alabama that consisted of work that the United States government wanted to buy American art and send it abroad as a kind of uh, come to America and live after World War II. And that was propaganda. And there were all these artists that were chosen uh, uh, from uh, uh, all parts of the country with a heavy influence from the, from the East Coast. And they bought tons of art. And they were in an exhibition in Alabama. And the government uh, finally wanted to get rid of it, had it in storage for many years, and sold it off very cheaply. All these artists were so moving to me. I mean, first of all, the government wanted to get rid of it because Congress started to see the Ashcan School, which didn't give a very pretty picture of America, all the slums and so forth. We're not doing this. So there were all these artists that were attempting to they wanted to be modern. They wanted to be of their time. And they were playing with cubism mm -hmm. in such sweet and poignant and innocent ways. I was deeply moved by that show. And somehow I 
going? <laughs> Your guess. I'm following you. Well, just that, that uh, actually I feel there's some connection to that in the recent work because it is, as we go back to that, uh, based on formalism, but I, there are moments where I just do things that look, that looks so innocent. That doesn't look like, you know, a, a real painter who's been painting for so many years. But I just wanted to stick it in. And it seems to have a little flavor of that kind that these, these people were so moving. You know the name, I mean, you know, if people that know our history know the names of these people. Um, I actually am going to read something because it comes to mind, and it's simply a short quote from the essay that Alexander Schwartz wrote for the monograph. And she states, Carlson's searching nature has led her to continually reinvent styles, techniques, and modes of production. Yet a constant throughout her work is a spirit of optimism that is all too rare in the contemporary art world. And when you're talking about how moving this show was to you and how innocent some of it seemed, and particularly American interpretations of European-originated ideas, such as Cubism, I'm wondering, particularly now in today's world, where does your optimism come from? It's waning. <laughs> it's waning. It's waning. I mean, you know, it's very hard right now to keep your head above water. But it's true. I've always been, I've always seen the glasses half full, and they be you know pretty much all the way full. I don't know why that is. I mean, it's just the nature of my personality. And as I said, I've tried to do depressing paintings, and they don't. They've never, been, they've never been successful. So I just try to go with the flow. Because one of the uh, uh, ongoing criticisms uh, that I have is that it sometimes go, goes too far into a happy mood, mm -hmm. and which always annoys me because uh, it's, it's very serious art, mm -hmm. even though it, it has some humor and it doesn't mean that I'm having a good time taking it mostly. It's very hard work. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know where to say, but perhaps my family, perhaps my environment, but I grew up as an optimist. And I know because I have many dear friends that are not optimists. I thought everyone was until I came to New York. <laughs> 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 how, how many people are seriously depressed? <laughs> In terms of coming to New York, as we've mentioned a few times, you came from Chicago, and one of my associations with the city of Chicago is great architecture, and I associate that with your work as well. And I wonder what are some of your uh, feelings about the connection between your painting and your installations uh, and some objects but largely the site-specific installations, how that relates to architecture, or does it relate to architecture no, it does. for you? It, it does. There's a structure of, of, of architecture behind a lot of the work. And I, I have said that, well, it's probably from uh, growing up in Chicago because of its marvelous history in Chicago, but that's a lie, actually. The, the, the truth is that the when I started coming off the canvas, for somehow edge has always been an issue, and the question of why is it there, what is it doing there, you know, that, and poking out in my various works so that and so at some point, the, the edge disappeared, the, as an edge as edge disappears altogether, and I was using the whole room. So if you use the whole room, you are naturally considering the architect, architect. Mm -hmm. So since, uh, it was the architecture that of, of the place in which I was doing so many of these installations. Architecture felt as a very important ingredient, and it has remained. But that still doesn't tell me why, if I go back to early student work, there was an architectural feel to it. So, um, I don't I can't say any more about that. It's there, and it's important, and it always has been. But um, uh, I can't find the origins any better. <laughs> when I think about architecture, I think obviously of space, of form, but I also think of what is the difference between a house and a home? What is the difference between a place and, uh, the, the, or the structure and a sense of place? 
And one of the differences between house and home is, uh, is our associations, what we bring to it, the, the emotional response that we embed in the space so that the line between house and home gets blurred. And I think about that in your work, so that yes, it's about architecture, but it feels to me like part of what you're doing uh, is embedding association and emotion in the architecture. Yeah, Anna Katz talks about that in, in her, um, in her uh, essay in the book, and uh, it's true. One of my dear friends uh, in the 70s was an artist named Marie Morton, and um, she's passed away, uh, but um, we had a number of discussions uh, uh, during our friendship about the home as a grounding place. I mean, she had a very different background. She was a married woman with three children and became divorced and then decided to go to art school. So her grounding in the importance of home and family was way developed before mine was. I was an independent, going to law parties and dancing. I, you know, very immature, as so many artists are, uh, late into their age. And, um, but the issue of home was as a place, as an important place for the idea of art to take place, became important. Uh, and it came out in the art, I mean, wallpaper, yes, and, and a, a grounding in, in the everyday, the things around us that make our home important to us as, 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 as the spot where everything important happens, as the spot where we let our pants down, as the spot where we become who we, who we are really. Uh, so that, as a grounding, was very important during uh, many of those years that I was doing the installations. Even though I wasn't aware of it. <laughs> Not necessarily, for a time. The book documents that there are distinct bodies of work. And that while obviously there are many, many through lines, that your career can be seen, or your professional life can be seen um, in segments. Can you talk about how a particular body of work comes into being when you know that it's finished or when you feel like you want to move on to another? Or uh, it, it, is that something that you think about? Well, there are several answers to that. One is that a number of my good friends, uh, dear friends, are sculptors. And they happen to be sculptors that seem to work in series. And one series doesn't necessarily have a look that the next series does. And so I never had the idea that I had to be consistent because these were the people that influenced me. Um, but I've never been able to be consistent because uh, my head jumps around. You know, there are some people that can nurture an idea and keep it alive for their lifetime. And I know some artists who I respect very much who have done that. And there is progress, but it's you know incremental and it moves along with its own kind of logic. I've always felt if I were ever to get, really have a large retrospective, that it would look like a big group show. But uh, other people tell me that, no, that's not so. There is a through line. There is something consequential that makes and, and a lot of people have been doing the research for this book made me understand that what some of those issues are, where I find things that I did long ago that have a lot to do with what I'm doing now and I've never seen it, you know. So uh, it's just the kind of artist I am, that, you know, like Picasso. <laughs> <laughs> well, in some ways, actually, I think that he did give license to the idea that you didn't have to have a consistency, that that actually is a, is a contribution that he makes to, uh, to 20th century art. So it doesn't seem like a completely uh, uh, random association. I think that's probably true, but it's, I mean, it is true, but I think it's probably true for going back a fair amount in history as well. It's just this, from our point of view, a lot of historical works from other centuries, you know, they, we don't see the radical changes as easily unless we are in the business of art scholarly uh, examinations. Um, so I wouldn't give him full credit right. uh, for a lot of things, but certainly credit. Um, but, uh, you 
a lot of major artists have made big shifts in their art. And um, yeah, he's just one of them. Are there artists, or certainly there are artists from, from history whose work resonates with you, who maybe were inspiring, but in any case, who you felt were communicating to you, do, do uh, any artists come to mind? Well, this is a huge list. It goes back to the beginning of time. Marie Morton was a very important person to me, and she's a wonderful artist, but I have, I have friends that I think have influenced me. I have um, other artists whose work I admire in um, contemporary art. Uh, I love uh, many um, arts from other centuries. I love Tiepolo, it's a big favorite of mine. Um, and you know, when I was in art school, I think you could either be dutiful or you could um, try to be a rebel, which that almost became an academic position in the 20th century. I had to make something new and different. Um, and I wanted to do that, even though I didn't know what I was doing. And so for a long time, I was guided by a rejection of art history, and it's only as a mature artist that I have become deeply immersed in the history of art and totally respectful of the immense contributions that various ages have made to, to us and to everyone else. This is the reason I love museums. I mean, I, uh, I feel that They've given me access to cultures and times and places which I never would have known anything about if I hadn't um, had that access. Speaking of, of history, uh, makes me think about time. And, okay, here we go. So we've got a few more minutes here, speaking of time and running out of it. But I, I think about in the, in, around the year 400 BC, uh, Hippocrates said, uh, life is short, art is long. And that has been widely interpreted as meaning that art lasts. But there are also people who interpret that as meaning that art takes a long time to make. And I think that I, uh, it's interesting to me that the title of the book is Cynthia Carlson's 60 Years. Because clearly that's an identifier, it simply tells you the amount of time you've been working, it tells the reader the amount of time you've been working, but maybe it's more than that. Maybe it has something to do with an interest in time, with the mystery of the passage of time, with the time that it takes to make work, and with the time that it takes to appreciate work, that to, to, to look at it and to really have it speak to you. So I'm simply wondering, as we're running out of time, if time is interesting to you in your work, not simply in terms of the quotidian reality of it, but in terms of the concept of it. Well, I have to say that the way I look at art now has changed dramatically. I mean, I don't need more than one room in a museum, in a good museum with three, four works in it to keep me totally engaged for a long time. That didn't used to be the case. It, learning to see takes a long time. And so, um, but then there's another issue is that I'm 81, and my time <laughs> is, I mean, I think more in terms of a legacy that was behind my interest in doing the book because many of the installations that occupied me for well over a decade were in temporary venues around the country at art institutions and museums. And what I have left was cardboard boxes and $10,000 worth of photographs. So the book started out as being uh, uh, an interest in, in documenting, in having a legacy, in having those things. I thought they were good, and I wanted them to last. So, and then I just got carried away and it's <laughs> my whole life. But, but it started out that way. And, and uh, I do think now of time as being extremely precious. I don't want to waste it. I don't want to waste it on people that uh, don't uh, interest me. I don't want to waste it on things that don't interest me. I want to spend it with the quality of the people around me that I care about and that sort of thing. And, you know, whatever art can come out of that from now on till whenever. <laughs> well, thank you for spending some of your time with me. And with us.